the Hasidic group that I uh, that I came from, or left, or some would say escaped from. Uh, <coughs> This is Hasidim loyal to a popular dynasty of Rebis whose court, before the Holocaust, was situated in the suburb of Warsaw called Gura Korvalia. Okay? And I just want to point out to you that you've heard the word, you've heard the, 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 the term strimal for, uh, for, for the fur hat. But there really are three types of hats. So it's different cats for different hats. Okay? Uh, think of it in terms of like. Uh, Think of Hasidim as like white socks and black socks, uh, <clears throat> round heads and cavaliers. And what you have here with the Gera Rebbe is a, uh, he's, he's wearing a spudik. This is a raised, a tall version of the strimal. Uh, and this is uh, specific to Hasidim who lived in Congress, Poland, in that area around Warsaw and Lodz, and also in uh, certain parts of the Ukraine, so that when you get to see the the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, not the last one, but the one before, also wore a similar kind of spudik. And here you see uh, my, my father's Rebbe uh, in his boxing pose, and that had to do with the fact that he was <laughs> caught in the act of being photographed. Oh. You see? Now you can see the guy on the left, he managed to ward off the, 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 the guy at the camera, he managed to move away and block, block at the face, but the Rebbe, uh, got caught in the act, so he decided to make it into something humorous. And this was his son, this was uh, my, my Hasidim, my Rebbe, when I was growing up in Cheder. He lived in Israel, so I never uh, actually got to meet him. And this is what the Hasidim looked like. You can, you can tell Gera Hasidim, they're referred to as the Gera Kazakhs, because they wear Italian priest hats, but they also wear Kazakh boots. So. Uh, you know, uh, some Hasidim wear white socks, others wear black socks, uh, still others wear half shoes. Um, the Gera Hasidim, you can, you'll always remember them as Kenny's boys by uh, the, 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 the Italian priest hats that they wear. Where are they from? Okay. These are the Gera Hasidim, from, from Gura Corvalia, uh, from Gera, Poland? in Poland. Yeah. Yes. And here you see, an exception to the rule, Relating to the old country is the present Boston Rebbe, who just passed away about two weeks ago, and he's wearing a strimal. You can see the difference between the strimal and the spudik, and he's wearing a tishchalapel. What he's wearing is not the bekisha that one wears on the on the Shabbos to go to, go to the black silk bekisha, long uh, kaftan, but this is this is uh, the, the 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 kaftan that he wears when he's holding court, and not necessarily on the on the Shabbos. So the Boston Rebbe, what, I'm sorry? You can make it more clear on the screen. You can focus uh, the projector. You want to focus in the projector so it looks like that? You can't be focused anymore. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so the Boston Rebbe, who was a fluent English speaker, uh, whose father came to the United States as a young man in pre-World War II period and established a Hasidic court in Boston, Mass., and that's why they're referred to as the Boston Hasidic. Okay? Uh, now, uh, in, in the very beginning, uh, there was a violent opposition from, from the old guard ultra-orthodox, led by the Goan of Vilna, Elijah of, of Vilna. And, <clears throat> and the, uh, the, brunt, the brunt of his attacks was directed against the, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, Shnir Zalman of Liadi. They were accused of uh, starting, another, starting another religion or another sect, that they were a Sabbath, they, they were uh, a, another radical Sabathian sect. They didn't emphasize learning. They were into doing somersaults. They loved to get drunk. They, they uh, emphasized, <laughs> well, the, the dirty part, I, this is Jews, uh, <clears throat> not, not Russians calling uh, Hasidim dirty Jews. They, they called each other dirty Jews. In any event, um, so the, uh, what happened over time is that um, they would uh, slander each other and they would snitch on each other and in both, in both the Lubavitcher Rebbe and the Vilna Gaon end up spending time in the Tsarist dungeons. And this battle uh, it still was raging uh, into, the 21, into the 21st century because uh, Rabbi Eliezer Shach, who is one of these old guard Litvak Misnagdim, the oppositionists to the Hasidim, 
Uh, he said that when the Mashiach comes, you're not going to need bumper stickers to announce his coming. And uh, he he was uh, in, you know he uh, he was uh, out there in the vanguard of uh, people who were uh, the the traditional ultra orthodox Jews who were um, opposed to the Rebbe uh, making uh, a Messiah out of himself. I just want to show you something here, and I, the picture doesn't it doesn't come out looking clear, but. What, what I was trying to show you here is that this is in Jerusalem, and they look like they wear the, the black, uh, the, the kapolish, the samet kapolish, and they have extremely long pace and beards, but they are not Hasidim. Just because somebody has a beard and pace and looks like a Hasid doesn't necessarily mean that they're Hasidim. That there are, it's really, uh, they wear a particular type of kaftan that indicates that these are Ashkenazim of the old Yishuv. Meaning that they came uh, or were descended from the line of, of the Vilna Gaon, sent delegations of, uh, of uh, his students to, uh, to, to come establish colonies in, uh, in, old, uh, in, in, in old Palestine. And they, are, they make up part of the, what, was known, what is known today as the Eida Chareida, and also some of them belong to the Naturi Karta. If they're associated with the Satma Rebbe in terms of their, uh, their politics vis-a-vis -vis Israel, meaning they're vi violently opposed to the state of Israel, then, uh, then they're, uh, then they're uh, identified with the Naturi Karta. But many of them look like that, and you walk around Me Sharim, you would think that uh, you're looking at Hasidim, but they, they really are not. And this is what their children look like. And the giveaway, again, is the, the yarmulke, that type of Yerushalmi yarmulke with the, with the payas. Is, there's no way of really gauging or knowing uh, whether these are, uh, these are, uh, Hasid, these are Hasidim. Now, now, the Rebbe is referred to, this is, uh, this is uh, the sons of Rebbe, who uh, established a great uh, dynasty of uh, Galiziana Hasidim, the Klosenberger, the Bobova, the Gorlitza, some of you may have roots uh, back there. The, he is the, you could say, the founder of uh, Galician Hasidism. And these Rebbe's are referred to as Admorim, which stands for Adoni Moreni Verabeni, my, my Lord, my, my teacher, and my rabbi. My yeah. And here you see, this is, um, this is uh, the, the Rebbitzin, this is Rabbi Schneerson's wife, and uh, the women, women, uh, the Rebetzin, invariably is um, somebody who has yichas, meaning she has pedigree. She's usually, the, the Hasidic Rebbe's try to marry from within, within their own group. Uh, and it's especially uh, endogamous in, um, among the Chabad rabbis, because the, a lot of the rabbis were uh, cousins, the, 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 the husbands and wives were, were cousins, and some people say that that's why some of them weren't able to conceive that the Rebbe's wife was not able to have children because of this incredible mixing. Now, um, here's the old way of, uh, the old style. Um, the, the man on the, the left looks, uh, he, he still has the, 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 standard, uh, the standard dress of uh, Hasidic uh, princeling, uh, this is probably this was probably taken on on uh, Lagboma or uh, Chalamoid, uh, the intermediary days, uh, the holidays, because he is wearing his Shabbos or Yontif costume, and the white socks are a giveaway that he's a he, he's a Hungarian Hasid, that he comes from Hungarian uh, the Hungarian sects. The wife um, today by today's standards, you, you'll excuse me, she would be considered uh, somewhat slutty because. Uh, uh, this is really what they look like. This is what a woman looks like in the same satma, uh, because everything is moved to the right. Because uh, as long as Levi Strauss and uh, is going to be uh, dressing 16-year-old girls in very tight Levi jeans, and they're going to have posters of it around town, which will um, bring about lewd and lascivious thoughts to these uh, Jewish boys. Um, you have to build walls and walls around the Torah. You have to build Gedorim around the Torah. And so that's where you wonder where the fanaticism is coming from. Uh, it's a reaction to American uh, licentiousness. It's a reaction to the 60s and 70s. And so that's what's been going on. And here you see the, Bel the Bel this is the Belzer Rebbe and his, uh, his son, who's been groomed to be a Rebbe. 
And so with the bells, they have a tradition of already at the age of 13, the, the boy wears, uh, wears them. This is not a stranul, and it's not a spudic. This is a kolpak. Okay, and it's somewhere between a strimal and a uh, and a uh, spudic. Is this contemporary? This is all can is all contemporary. Yeah. So here you see uh, hats being sold. Uh, I can't. I, I brought my. I didn't bring my gla my reading glasses with me, so I'm in a little bit of trouble here. Um, so I get to see in Williamsburg. Uh, I pulled this off a telephone pole, uh, and I can tell you that uh, the strimal is is twelve hundred dollars. That's like uh, five years ago. Uh, they probably almost doubled in price. You won't be able to get a, a strimal for less than two thousand dollars. What's it made out of? Uh, it's made out of uh, fur, usually um, mink or weasel or beaver fur, uh, depending on the, the region. Uh, won't help me. Uh, now, uh, before World War II, there, almost every Hasidish, Hasidic man who was not part of the rabbinical family wore. Uh, a kashketl, that that cap that the man is wearing, that's called a kashketl. Today, uh, the only people who still wear kashketlach are young boys under the age of 13 among the Galiziana Hasidim, the Babava and the Belza. And, yeah. Uh, should we wait with the questions, maybe? Because we have to have a half hour. I have only so much time. Uh, so, uh, here you see uh, the, the kid with the payas and up the the two things that you need to understand about Hasidim, that they, uh, they take literally this uh, translation of the Bible that you're supposed to leave uh, the, the locks from your temple, but the, the, uh, you let them grow long. But the question is, how long? So with Hasidim, there's a concept called lefnim mishur tadim, to go beyond the prescription of the law. So. Uh, and so that, that can mean that in some cases it's hanging from, you know, from the floor and you're stepping on it. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, in, in, my, in my Hasidic sect, the payas would grow so long that they would take it and they would uh, tie it up on top of their head, put a plop of yarmulke on that, and then the Italian priest hat over that. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, here you have from the Rogic of uh, a decree about uh, touching the beard. And what he's pointing out is that in Talmudic times, people could receive um, bas bastinado, or, or they could be flagellated uh, up to 39 times if they touch their beards. And, uh, well, this is, uh, this is ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Uh, here you see uh, a, a, an extreme example of an untouched beard. This, uh, this Rebbe, uh, Steinman, has a matted beard, and the fear was that uh, he would emulate um, uh, the, the pagans in uh, biblical times who would pull out the hair from their faces uh, when somebody died. And in order not to, not to imitate the pagans from ancient times, he has a tradition, he had a tradition of not even touching his beard because the concern was that he would be, in Yiddish it's called rasen kriya, to be pulling for the sake of mourning. And to be identified with that. With that. Uh, uh, now here you have the the tradition, the musical traditions of the Hasidim, because Hasidism emphasizes joy and song and dance. And this Rebbe, uh, he uh, he was not only an outstanding Rebbe, great Rebbe, but he was also a composer and a musician. And um, you'll, uh, I think uh, it's a little bit out of place here, but uh, you'll get to see. Uh, uh, you get to see some uh, Hasidic uh, orchestra. And this is the Tish. This is the Tish of the Belzer Rebbe. So the Tish is where the Rebbe holds court, where he gives Torah talks, where he distributes Shchayim. Shchayim is um, he, t he eats a piece of fish, for example, and he'll just taste it. And then, because he's already touched it and graced it, he now distributes it among his Hasidim. And everybody wants to get a little a uh, little taste of that. So here are different uh, Titian. So here you see uh, the, the Vishnitsa Rebbe, uh, a Galiziana Rebbe, with his, you can see his Tishchalatl, uh, wearing that special garb, which is not a Bekisha, uh, and he's, uh, he's engaged in singing while they're drinking. And uh, here is the, the Karliner Pinska, these are Lithuanian, Lithuanian Hasidim. Uh, there aren't too many Lithuanian Hasidim other than Chabad and uh, Stalin and uh, Karlina, 
Uh, this is one of the few remaining Hasidic groups. And uh, here you see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The Lubavitchers uh, were had a di different tradition, not so much in, uh, distributing Schreien and Vieren Tisch, but really having a Fabrengen. A Fabrengen is, uh, takes place on uh, right after the holidays or on the holidays, after Shabbos, uh, to commemorate the anniversary of a Rebbe being liberated from a Tsarist prison. And it's a time for people to get good and drunk, and also to wish to wish the Rebbe L'chaim. Uh, the Rebbe, by the way, I have uh, the pictures of the Rebbe. Um, he was actually a very modern person, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He really didn't intend to become Rebbe. And you can see on the left, if you can see it, uh, he's wearing a fancy uh, brown suit, which is uh, almost uh, sacrilegious in the Hasidic world. He also has a, he had a, a hat, or he wore a flap in his hat, and that is also considered to be some kind of innovation, which is why most of the other Hasidic sects didn't want to have anything to do with Chabad. Uh, and here he goes from... Okay, so here you see Chabad, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, now dressed up like, like a Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, and here you see that they, they are into being the Karif, they're into going out and proselytizing among, among other Jews, which is... Uh, not the policy of any other Hasidic sect, because they believe that when you're ready, you're ready to <coughs> to come back to the fold. Um, you'll you come to us. We don't need to go to you. And here you can see uh, this literally looks like a Chabad rabbi in Hong Kong going fishing for for Jews. <laughs> and uh, here you see. And I'm going to stop right here. Uh, well, two more. This is a kvittel. This is a kvittel. This is a, a little note that uh, Hasidim pass to their Rebbe. They want their, if they, if their, uh, somebody in their family is not feeling, is not well, if, uh, if they're going into business, they want a blessing from the Rebbe, they write up a little, uh, 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 they, they write up this bequest from the Rebbe, and the Rebbe will read it, and he makes a blessing over the, the kvittel, and the hope is that, uh, that the, the blessing will come to, uh, to fruition. Uh, so here you see uh, an upshevenish, uh, when a boy uh, starts his, uh, his first uh, rite of passage is when he's three years old, when he starts to learn the olive base. They shave off his, his, uh, his head bald and just leave the pace. By the way, the head is bald because, of, um, because it's called being um, a mechitzef by the tefillin, which comes from the word chutzpah. In other words, if you have a pompadour, um, your tefillin stand in the way between your between your forehead and and the heavens. So for that reason, they shave their heads com uh, completely bald. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, and this is the the, the bub of a rebbe, um, the bub of a rebbe uh, with his uh, chag or choir. And uh, you know, for Malava Malkus, uh, for a, a time of Purim, certain uh, so different Hasidic sects. Uh, emphasized uh, music and the Bhavava in addition to the Majitzer were the two um, two of the leading sects emphasizing music. Okay, I, because I'm in such a rush, I, I want to go now to um, to Hasidism uh, and Yiddish. And uh, uh, yeah. let's. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through this with you. This will be grist for hopefully conversation. We're not going to do the whole thing. So let me point out to you that. Hasidim regard Yiddish as the hallowed vehicle of the traditional way of life and the ideal medium for scriptural exegesis. Many Hasidim regard the use of Hebrew for everyday purposes as blasphemy. Rather, as the more radical among them, for example, the Satma, refuse to recognize the state of Israel since they believe that the reestablishment of the Jewish kingdom in the Holy Land must await the coming of the Mashiach. Since modern Hebrew contains new words, like basketball and uh, holy dash um, that are made up and created by various Hebrew poets and writers, how can Hasidic Jews expose their children to a language that contains no riach or spirit or kedusha or holiness? What's more, the Hebrew language is so closely connected with Zionism that one is exposed to the language, one must be associated with Zionism, which is strictly forbidden in the Hasidic community. Hasidim won't speak Yiddish to a secular Jew 
because they don't want to advance the presence of a secular Jew who speaks Yiddish. Speaking to a secular Jew in only in English enables them to treat him as a not quite bona fide Jew. Also, speaking to a secular person in Yiddish will complicate and compromise their image of a secular person and be a bad sign for their children. Because Yiddish, for the Hasidic family, is the daily part and parcel of the religious way of life. It is not a language that one cultivates for personal or intellectual or cultural reasons. Yiddish is not a language like any other that might be, that might help somebody else to learn. Now, let me just go right down to the bottom because I'm already, uh, down, uh, I'm, I'm run, running out of time. I do want to show you five, this three minutes. Five minute, more minutes. Five more minutes? Okay, so the Lubavitchers, uh, oh, here, an interesting thing. Down to, let's go down to today. The opposite phenomenon is true in Israel. Yiddish among the Hasidim is not the Mamelushin, but the father tongue forsaken in the family setting. Hebrew is generally spoken at home, and it is only upon reaching the totally male setting of the higher yeshiva that the boys will be initiated into the secrets of what was considered a feminine language. Because Silver Katz points out that Yiddish is the language of the chivalrous Jewish male, uh, meaning the Tal Talmudic scholar, and, uh, and Yiddish was the language of the ignoramuses and, you'll excuse me, the women. So, <clears throat> um, now, uh, to the Hasidim, the language is not central, nor is it ide uh, uh, idolized. To them, it is in fact a jargon, but they accept that and they are proud of it. And the Lubavitchers, more than any other Hasidic group, are rapidly losing Yiddish. There is a preponderance of Bali Teshuvas among them, uh, returners to the path who come from totally assimilated backgrounds. There are also Chabadniks who come from Sephardic. Because the Rebbe was busy, uh, you know, uh, doing Ufaratzka, Yoma, Vakedma, Tsefono, Venegba, spreading the message east and west, north and south. So uh, the, over, over the decades, uh, various Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, Yemenites, Georgians, North Africans, also were drawn into the sect. These, these people come from, from a very different tradition. They didn't have Yiddish in their background. So these latter nouveau Hasidim were brought into the fold by Chabad outreach workers in Israel and invariably speak Hebrew as their mother tongue. Can we get that three minute uh, video going? Do I have three minutes? Yes. Okay. I just want you to get a taste of this. This is called a mitzvah tensel, and this is the Bubba of the Rebbe. My mother came from the Bubba of the Hasidic sect, and so I knew the Bubba of the Rebbe very well. Because I used to get Shmura Matzah from him, we used to go to the Bubba of a Mikvah. My, on my father's side, I came from the Gera Hasidim, but the Bubba of the Rebbe lived on Brooklyn Avenue in Brooklyn, just about two blocks from the Chabad 770 Eastern Parkway. So I used to alternate between going to the Gera Shtibel and going to the to the Bubba of a rabbinical court because the Rebbe was alive and well when I was a when I was a young kid. So let's uh, show them. Let's just push that press uh, art. So um, after we see this video, we're going to have a, a little time for questions, right. and we'll have questions while we're switching over. Like you know, seeing his family again.
entertain a few questions uh, while sure, we're sure, switching sure, over. Sure. So we've got a question over here. Uh, my question is, uh, did these men of the beard view the beard. God Almighty as harsh, A, a good, a good, kind God, B, or both, their view of the God Almighty? I think it has to do with, we're talking really, there's, there's a, a, you know, there's a, the abstract, you know, Hasidic mentality, and then there are the individuals, you know. <laughs> so you have to ask, you have to ask the individual, and I'm sure, you know, you'll get all kinds of responses. Yeah. And the rabbi, and where rabbi comes from, rabbi? Comes from rabbi, but rabbi, rabbi means specifically in this case, the Rebbe of Hasidic court, the Rabbi of Hasidic court, um, and also sometimes you, sometimes there's an alternative term called a Ruv, R O V, and the Ruv is somebody who, uh, like the Babava that you see here and the Satma Rebbe, before they were Hasidic Rebbe's, they were um, either the head of the rabbinical academy or the Av Bestin, meaning they were the the leading judge in the, in that city. Uh, so uh, they were also Talmudic scholars. They were outstanding Talmudic scholars. Not all not all Hasidic rebbe's are Talmudic scholars, but uh, if they came out of a, a, a background where they were uh, Russia yeshiva, or uh, if they were uh, came out of the, the uh, uh, they came out of the based in, uh, in in that case they were oftentimes also referred to as the Huv, the Bab Rebbe or the Bab Yeah. So. Rabbitson is the Rebbe's wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when it's rabbis and men. Is there any special term as rabbis and women? There were a few one or two cases where there were rabbis who were women, but uh, they had to, they couldn't actually face the, the male public. They had to, um, they had to. Yeah. Do everything through uh, you know, intermediaries. Yeah, and they were, they were, but what's the special term for a, a woman rabbi? Rabbitson. A rabbitson. That's a rabbi's wife. Rabbi's wife. And what about a woman rabbi? That's good. The rabbi. But if you went to Yeshiva University, then that's, guy, that's where the guy would go. Couldn't you be a, a scholar? Go. Are you a scholar? Or not yeah, even then? Huh? Yeah, but not that's not Hasidim. That's not Hasidim. That's <laughs> okay. modern Orthodox. Okay. Okay. They have nothing to do with modern. And what modern. did you say in the beginning? That's no. yeah. What is their source of income? Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> um, they are they are tend to be poorer than anybody else. Uh, they they're hardworking people mostly. They try to do work that doesn't require using their brains because they use their brains specifically for the time that they spend in the in, in the uh, base medrash studying Talmud. So uh, they're obviously not going to university. So they're not studying philosophy. They're not studying engineering. Uh, so and oftentimes they're like they're involved in, 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 in you know in doing the service industry. They're involved in butchers, shopkeepers. Uh, they work in the diamond industry, although there's a whole misconception about what the diamond industry is about. The diamond industry is like one capitalist guy and a bunch of, you know, a bunch it's of work, working drones, a bunch of working drones making, making 15, 20 bucks an hour and having to buy, having to buy a Strymel for $1,500. So, Security you know, officer. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, Lubavitchers uh, are from their Litvaks? Uh, well, yes, they're, they're, yeah, they were part of white, white Russia. They, they, the Rebbe's came from uh, Ekaterina Slav. They were uh, Lit Litvak, Latvian, Ukrainian. Yeah. Lubavitch. Lubavitch. Yeah. But they were not. They were never really a significant group. You have to understand. They're not in the Hasidic world. They're not. They're 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 Rebbe, they're they're Hasidim to the Reform Jews. You <laughs> so Hasidic Jews don't need to deal with Chabad because you see a Chabad are innovators. Exactly. You see the fact that he's got a flap, the fact that he he walked around without it. I have a picture of him without a yarmulke. He was photographed. The Rebbe photographed without a yarmulke, mm -hmm. and the uh, the Hasidim tried to do one of those Stalinist uh, falsification <laughs> things where they try to touch up before they even had workshop and uh, photo <laughs> Photoshop. They try to put a yarmulke on the Rebbe's head. I didn't want to show this to you because I didn't make, want to make a scandal, but I'm making a scandal anyway. So uh, I have a picture in here when I give a class on history of Hasidism. I show this one picture where the Rebbe took his yarmulke off.
to be photographed. This is um, this is the most uh, sacrilegious thing that you can do in the physician world. Yeah. Yeah. So you obviously made some journey outside of that world. I'm curious. Uh, when you first saw that was that a difficult journey to make, and do you find that others or many others make that journey? Well, I can give you my psychiatrist's telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk to him about, about that. Uh, yeah, I, want me, I mean, you want me to tell you my whole story? I'm standing on one foot right now. <laughs> yeah, a summary, a synopsis. Uh, synopsis. Synopsis? A okay. really short synopsis. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, that I'll, that I'll be very honest with you. Okay. I myself exactly. wanted to, to remain a chassid. My, fa my father, actually, um, he was... Um, he was a terribly debilitated Holocaust survivor who did, didn't get along with a lot of people. Oh. And so his alienation drove him away mm -hmm. from his Hasidic compatriots. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we went into exile, and we even spent a year davening in Chabad on 770 Eastern Parkway. And then my father found his groove among the, the ultra-Orthodox non-Hasidim, took us out of the Hasidic yeshivas, sent us to the ultra-Orthodox yeshivas that had a semblance of a secular studies program. Uh, and you have to realize that I didn't really speak English with any degree of regularity until I was maybe 13, 14 years old. And, uh, and I've written a couple of books in English. So uh, I've had to do an enormous amount of making up. Uh, and uh, I really felt like when I came out of high school, I mean, I did get into college, but I was not really, I wasn't really prepared. Uh, but anyway, so that was basically, that's the, but then, you know, then there was also the late 60s, and, but, uh, you know, this was a process, this was a process for me. And uh, there's lots of stuff that I just don't want to share in public. Right? But, uh, yeah. I, I want to hold the question now because we've got Zachary Baker. Oh, great, great. And then we're going to have 20 minutes or more for more questions. So hold oh, right, questions right. Until he gets his full half hour. hour. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so I'm going to ask the people in the front to move slightly to. Actually, here's my suggestion: is yeah. if you could scoot around a little bit this way, as you're getting closer to the stage. Well, you're okay, but we need to make things clear, so we can have you switch over. Sorry, this has to be. Yeah. Is that okay, Zachary? Yeah. Um, my interest in this subject doesn't come from having uh, grown up in the Hasidic community or even had any contact with the Hasidic community until I was in my mid-twenties. And that was when I was uh, in my first job as a librarian at the Evo Institute for Jewish Research in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the workplace, I come from a completely secular background, actually not really a Yiddish-speaking background, although I learned Yiddish later. Uh, but uh, in the workplace, leaving aside the people who came to visit uh, the Institute, we had a range of people from uh, Polish-born Bundists, uh, Jewish socialists, that is, to uh, Lubavitch, uh, a Lubavitch Yiddish-speaking secretary, mm -hmm. to a receptionist from Williamsburg in Brooklyn, who I think her background was some kind of Hasidic Yiddish, was certainly her native language. And then there were all of the people who came to visit uh, the YIVO Institute, especially when you're talking, Ken mentioned uh, Chalamoy, the, inter the intermediate days of uh, Sukkot and Pesach, which are not considered Chag, but uh, holiday, that is. But, uh, uh, but when people are off in, in the Hasidic community, are off from work, and we would be flooded with visitors coming to use our library and archives, primarily for genealogical uh, reasons of genealogical and hagiographical interest, that is, interest in their rebbies. Mm -hmm. I came out here to Stanford in 1999, and this is not the Bay Area, California in general, but especially the Bay Area is not a hotbed of Hasidism, <laughs> or of Yiddish, although thank God we have some of that. Yeah. Uh, however, at Stanford I've been able, in, the, in my work in the library, to set up a, uh, sir, would you just, uh, I'm sorry, you're, we don't want to obstruct the screen. Uh, no, right now. Yeah. Uh, we, I set up a plan 
with a bookseller in Brooklyn who sells us all sorts of uh, books. Can you focus? No, we can't. That's as good as it gets. Uh, who, uh, anyway, I, I set up a plan with a bookseller in Brooklyn who sends us all kinds of uh, publications in uh, relating to Jewish life in these very, very religious, Haredi, ultra-Orthodox, whatever you want to call it, communities. And one of the things that comes across in the range of publications that we get, and I'm going to be showing a few uh, right now, examples of them, is, first of all, there's a linguistic continuum that exists in the Hasidic uh, world in the United States. We're not talking about a rigidly segregated, uh, separated uh, use of language. There are nuances and uh, there are uh, places where one language is used more than another. The preponderance of books we get in this uh, plan from the Beagle Eyes and Bookstore in Brooklyn, the preponderance are actually in Hebrew. And they are rabbinical texts, uh, halachic texts, um, uh, quotations of rebbes and, and, uh, and of other uh, Jewish sages, uh, tractates of the Talmud and the Mishnah. That's what is mostly coming out in that milieu. The language the second most prominent language in terms of the publications we get is English, maybe not surprisingly. And the third is Yiddish. But the number of Yiddish books that we get, and magazines, and you'll see a few examples, are uh, surprisingly uh, varied, and there isn't a shipment that comes that doesn't have a few uh, books or magazines in Yiddish. And we get maybe a dozen shipments from this bookseller each year. What you see on the screen here is a book, uh, the front and back covers of a book for children devoted to uh, penmanship. And here is a page uh, from, uh, a couple of pages from uh, the book. And, uh, and what they're teaching these children is how, first of all, to do a proper handwriting and secondly, they're teaching them vocabulary. So you see in the right, and everything uh, on my slides is meant to be read from right to left, is uh, draw a line between those objects uh, that start with the letter Aleph to the letter in the middle, the Aleph in the middle. And some of those objects are Aleph, like Eir in the lower right, or Odler in the lower left, but the one directly below the olive is milach. That is not an olive. Don't draw a line there. And then uh, on the left, there is a sample uh, phrase that you are supposed to write and demonstrate your penmanship. And the phrase is, from the tree of life thou shalt not eat. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, we get a lot of, a number of uh, uh, Yiddish magazines, and I'm interspersing these here with the books, and this is one of the first ones that started coming out that was meant to be a family magazine. It's called Malos, Milus, uh, Ascent, as in going up, and the front cover is on the right of that issue. Uh, uh, must have been somewhere around uh, Shvulis because there's a piece of cheesecake on, on the cover. And then there's the ad on the back, which is for, if you can uh, decipher it, what the boy uh, is holding in his hand, bar mitzvah package. That demonstrates, aside from the uh, consumerism uh, that is implicit in the $490 that you pay for the bar mitzvah package, I'm reading from my screen, 100% wool, one suit. Poly wool, one suit. Uh, a bekesha, uh, a raincoat. Mm -hmm. A tish bekeshe. Now, Ken, maybe you can tell me what that. I guess you're Chalati. sitting at the tish. Chalati. Tish chalati. Yeah. And then a yeshiva chalat, three pieces, uh, <laughs> three piece in English, yeshiva chalat in Yiddish, and Shabbos hoys, and that is uh, trousers uh, or, or whatever you wear on Shabbos. Uh, now, 
this I can't really uh, uh, I can't really as I say I can't focus it anymore this is just the setup we're given because of the uh, size of the room here uh, but on the left there's a little comic strip and it has to do with uh, uh, a little boy who is about to scoot out in front of a car and uh, he, uh, the lower right, uh, again this goes right, left, right, left, uh, he says, Oi, my bike is zerbrochen, my bicycle is broken. And the father says to the little boy, well, you should be thankful that, to God that you're intact. Basically forget about the bike. It's God who has saved you. And by the way, the uh, drawing of the mother, this is one of the few representations I have found of a woman in any of the magazines that we get uh, that cater to this particular uh, readership. On the right, although it's hard to make out, there's a whole series of uh, children's booklets, uh, um, and you see them kind of laid out at the bottom, but the the name of the series is Teure is the best is Teure, Torah is the best merchandise. <laughs> and if you had come here this morning, which I didn't, you would have, of course, seen a uh, demonstration of that, albeit in a very different spirit and vein. Uh, we saw the Bar Mitzvah package. Now on the back cover of another issue of Milas, we see a Chusen package, uh, a package for the groom. And... Uh, uh, even on my screen, it's a little small, I can't read it. One of the things that most fascinates me about the publications we get uh, from this uh, Hasidic world uh, or milieu are the advertisements. And this on the left is a uh, page of advertisements which uh, I don't think you would have seen similar ads in uh, a pre-war Hasidic publication in Poland. Emotional help on the left, upper left. Pain be gone, in English, on, on the lower right. Back pain, herniated disc, sciatica, fibromyalgia, carpal tunnel syndrome, acid reflux. I almost think that uh, we're going to be having a uh, nostrum sold to us by uh, a patent medicine salesperson. Credit problems? Uh, you don't need to uh, worry yourself about uh, uh, credit problems. Uh, now, example of a book that we got uh, from this uh, bookseller. It says, Haggadah shall Pesach miyuchad liyaladim, as a Haggadah for, for children. Uh, and it's 600 pages uh, of Haggadah and commentaries. Uh, there's a little bit of advertising on the back. This <coughs> caption with the little boy holding all those books is, the Shensta Afikoman, the finest Afikoman. In other words, go out and buy some more books that this publisher has uh, produced. And this is an example of what you see in the Haggadah. On the right, the actual uh, pa two pages, facing pages. One is text. Uh, this maror that we are eating, what is it about? And it's the text of the Haggadah in Hebrew on top. And then uh, uh, facing uh, Hebrew and Yiddish a little bit lower in these two columns on, the, on that page on the right. And then an illustration to demonstrate menhot gepeinik the Yidin, that they tortured for, uh, the Jews. And though you can't quite make it out, the man with the whip is dressed up as kind of a Cossack-like uh, garb, although the Jews themselves don't look like Russian Jews at all in terms of the way they're dressed. Um, education. Uh, no matter what their orientation, the law of the land is that the education that uh, children must, that children receive in Hasidic schools must include a component of secular education. And this book, which is several hundred pages long, is about the purity of education to save uh, for the future, save uh, for the future our, our, coming, uh, our coming generations, and it is in particular targeted against Goyesh school and what is being taught in that 
moral relativism, uh, and all sorts of other things that will lead children astray, and yet they are being taught in their classrooms. Oops, that's not quite uh, what I wanted to show there. I thought I had another slide with it. Uh, and how uh, it says here in the table of contents on the left that before World War II, we didn't have these kinds of problems when in our schools uh, with the types of secular books that were being taught for even arithmetic or, or reading the, the, the uh, state language. But now, everything, uh, there are threats coming at our children from every corner. And education, uh, we have to guard them against uh, this. There's actually a very interesting little memoir uh, by a, an Italian-American uh, school teacher in one of these schools in Williamsburg, one of these uh, uh, yeshivas, and it's called Teacha, T-E-A-C-H-A. Uh, the teacher, the writer, author's name is Jerry Alvarelli, and he, his experience in that book that he relates is what it was like to teach Hasidic boys who are being, uh, teach them English, uh, to, and, what, what it was, and they're being indoctrinated uh, at every uh, turn uh, to disregard everything that he is teaching them. <laughs> Jerry Alvarelli. Yeah. Uh, Modesty. Uh, uh, you can't quite see the caption that I wrote on the bottom. Modesty is the best policy. Mm -hmm. And those pictures that Ken showed uh, in his show uh, demonstrate the changes uh, in uh, women's practices. And this is a manual for women on how to dress modestly. It's called the Yiddish Pracht, uh, Jewish. Uh, glory or beauty, but not beauty in the sense of physical beauty, but uh, the kind of beauty that you would be glorified for uh, by the Rabboina Shalaylam, by God. And uh, there are, and you can't quite make it out, but in that picture on the left, the diagram on the left, but on the right page of that diagram, on that bottom row, you see two ways of, two proper ways of displaying your legs. <laughs> Knees, in the center there, is improper, but below the knees is proper. Uh, and this is another book that we have uh, that is in intended to demonstrate to the reader, presumably women uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the, its tales of modesty that illustrate the virtues of modesty. Now, unfortunately, because of the focus, what you can't see in that picture of Yemenite Jews on the left, which is intended to demonstrate their level of modesty, is that the faces of all of the females, this is a photograph, have been blurred, while those of the males of have not been. I believe it. When I first uh, uh, saw this book on the shelf, it's called A Kosher Koch, A Kosher Cook, I thought, that it had, was a cookbook, but no. It's about uh, all of the creatures that inhabit the food you eat, the unkosher creatures, worms and thrips. Oh I have gosh. no idea what a thrip is. Maybe you do if you're a gardener, but I don't. And, uh, and uh, bedikas toloyim, uh, this, uh, the quest, you know, you've heard of bedikas hummus, the quest for, for unleavened bread. Uh, the, uh, the night or two nights before Pesach. This is uh, the constant quest to rid your uh, diet of worms and mites and thrips and whatnot. Uh, you are what you eat. And uh, on the left hand slide, part of the slide, you see uh, correct and incorrect ways, or rather vice versa, of preparing broccoli. Because believe me, these things can, they, they will, they, they're everywhere. Even in the water you drink, and uh, some of you may have followed this uh, story, but uh, in New York City there were actually uh, there was a crackdown in the Hasidic community against uh, New York City tap water. Uh, there is a way around it: install a filter. Another of the Hasidic magazines we get is called Der Blick. Uh, the 
the outlook, I guess you would call it. Now that first magazine I showed you, Malos, is really a kind of family, home, educational, uh, didactic, uh, and not very high level in terms of its production values uh, magazine. But what one has noticed over the last 10 years is a whole array of Hasidic publications in Yiddish magazines that are very, very graphically uh, very high uh, value. And this is one of them. Now, I'm going to interject that the effects of the recession are definitely in evidence when I see what is coming in with these magazines now mm -hmm. as opposed to two years ago. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, a year and a half ago, Der Blick came in three or four different uh, uh, there were th three or four different blicks in every par package. One, now they've been all collapsed back into one. And what's more, there's much less advertising than there had been uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, so you see a little bit of advertising. You can't quite make it out on the uh, front cover on the lower right. It says, uh, New York Life, uh, the Riverview office, the company you keep, and then... Uh, uh, and uh, actually there's a story inside, the Blick, their Blick pays a visit to the office of New York Life. And that's what's called product placement. Uh, and what's the cover story? It's not about a Hasidic Rebbe, it's about uh, the uh, role of super tankers in the contemporary economy. And then other, uh, uh, and then uh, then another story, our economy under the new president. This was something, an issue that came out in February of 2009, a year ago. Uh, and then uh, at the bottom, uh, on the lower right, you see uh, a caption, Child abuse, existiert dos bei uns in Child abuse, is this something that exists among us Jews as well? And uns jeden means not us in this room, but them, the readers of this magazine. And indeed, if you follow the press, uh, Jewish and uh, uh, press and the uh, New York Times, you'll, you have, have probably noticed the occasional article on the subject of child abuse uh, in uh, very religious uh, Jewish communities. Uh, now, the feature that I decided I'd throw in uh, for this particular issue is Yortzeit and Bilder, and whose Yortzeit, which rabbi's Yortzeit are they uh, celebrating? The Kabbalist from, I believe, Morocco, Baba Sali. And so there is this, a little bit, uh, their, uh, their outlook goes a little bit beyond just the Hasidic community when they start talking about Jews. Uh, sir, if you don't mind uh, putting down that schedule. Uh, feature articles about kind of local interest. Schlacht uh, Hoys in Hartz von a slaughterhouse, in other words, a butchery, or well, a ritual slaughter and butcher in the heart of Borough Park. And you see the, it's a whole article that goes on and on and on about. Uh, this particular place where your chickens come from. Or you see uh, a little comic strip on the right, and on the left an article about the return of the dirigible, and, uh, and a photograph taken somewhere not far from here. And I've actually seen one of those flying over the Stanford Stadium uh -huh, on occasion. Uh, there are different types of leisure reading, uh, recreational reading, you'd find uh, in the books that we receive. This one, Zmiros Yisroel, is about, uh, is a history basically of chazonis, of, uh, of uh, cantorial uh, tradition, especially, it goes on and on and on about Josela Rosenblatt. Some of you have doubtless heard his recording. There's a cartoon on the left, uh, uh, which is, demonstrates uh, Reb Yosela Rosenblatt uh, and how he would, and it's a cartoon about how he refused to sing in the opera house on Chavez. And, the cat, and this is an old cartoon and they're reproducing it in this little book here. Uh, 
But Rosenblatt wasn't Hasidic, right? So <coughs> no. This is a sign of interest in the wider Jewish world. Absolutely. There are all sorts of signs about, of interest in the wider Jewish world. Uh, Jewish soldiers in Iraq, when the war first uh, uh, broke out in Iraq, uh, there were articles about uh, the Jewish chaplain uh, who was with the soldiers. Um, the caption uh, that I attach to this slide is, is there a badchen in the house? This is a rhyming dictionary in Yiddish, uh, which I don't need to elaborate on, although all I can say, it's called shtel tzuzam agram, put a, put a rhyme together. Well, all I can say is that the author, whoever it was, and it's an anonymous book, uh, was not familiar, clearly, with the other rhyming dictionary by Nochem Stuchkov, which came out, oh, maybe 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Uh, Stuchkov, the author of the uh, Der Oitzer von der Yiddischer Sprach, which is the thesaurus, the Roger's thesaurus of the Yiddish language, only much more than Roger ever uh, prepared. Uh, prepared. And, but, uh, so here are all sorts of rhymes. I'll just read a few. Great. Fardreit, Zedreit, Weissgedreit, Gedreit, Eingedreit, Zusammengedreit, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, every year, there is a white pages for, called Anshe Shlomenu, uh, uh, directory of the Satmar community worldwide. And we get one of these, uh, and uh, I don't think there are any in San Francisco, or if there are, there are uh, I haven't discovered them. And the front cover is on the right, and uh, the first page is uh, inside. And uh, again, it's hard to make out. But uh, one of the interesting features, uh, and, you, and I'm reading from here, okay, where are they living? Monroe, Brooklyn, Monroe, Brooklyn, Monroe, Brooklyn. There's a section also for uh, outside of... Uh, of New York, the New York area, uh, and Eretz Yisrael is a separate section. But one of the interesting features, and future genealogists are going to have a field day with these directories, is something, a section in each one of these called the son-in-laws list. Oh my gosh. So this is a page on the right from it, where, which connects uh, the sons-in-law with, uh, with their listings for their fathers-in-law in the other, the main part of the directory. Uh, and, uh, and you see these little ads on the back cover, and what really uh, got my attention, and you see they're mixed here, uh, some in English, some in Yiddish. Uh, the car rental one is in English. Oddly enough, the monument factory is also in English. I found that a particularly morbid, uh, but I guess that's the point. Uh, uh, Okay. There are suspense novels that are also being published in the Hasidic uh, community. Uh, this one is called The Stormy Contest, and it's by a writer who is known simply as Yud Weiss. And you see, uh, can't quite make it on the screen, it says, Danger, Delete. Uh, here's another magazine, and I'll just go this, through this kind of quickly. Uh, if uh, the Der Blick, which I showed you a minute ago, is uh, uh, got a mixture of Hasidic and non-Hasidic uh, interest. This is really kind of a, a uh, general interest magazine for the Hasidic re uh, reader. So one of the cover stories on the left is about Donald Rumsfeld, the Verteidigungsminister uh, oder Balletigungsminister, uh, Defense Minister or uh, Secretary of Defense or Secretary of Insults. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this was just uh, in the early years of the or early months of the Obama uh, administration. That that ship on the right isn't a super tanker, but it's a ship bringing in drugs into America. Uh, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, well, on the left, yes. Uh, it, the caption is. In New York, you'll find all sorts of interesting people. And, uh, and, but the, this comes in an article about the Madoff uh, affair, which is by no means uh, an attempt to defend Bernie Madoff, quite the contrary. 
But there's also a series uh, in this uh, magazine, Der Stern, uh, of uh, uh, suspense, uh, uh, serialized suspense uh, novel. This one is called Agent Zigzag. And there's a spin-off of Der Stern, which means the star, and it's Der Spaktiv, which means the spyglass. And what struck me about this particular issue, uh, the co cover story at the top on the right, is Muncie, the third largest orthodox city in the world. Uh, I guess Brooklyn and Jerusalem are the other two. Uh, and maybe Bnei Brak, I'm not sure. And what is interesting about this article, and it goes on pages and pages, of local history about Muncie, this town in Rockland County, uh, northwest of New York City, is the local history does not uh, blot out uh, what came before uh, the Hasidim and the old Orthodox Jews showed up. Uh, it is about Muncie, the city, and then, of course, Muncie, the great Jewish community. Uh, oh, and uh, there's another cover story about a shooting inc incident in Aspen, Colorado, uh, one of these uh, episodes that happens in this country every so often, uh, and uh, American capitalism versus Dutch socialism, and it's about, uh, is socialism really dangerous? And uh, it's about socialized medicine. The article cover story in this one is about the uh, uh, Masonic cult uh, that uh, uh, the uh, founding fathers were uh, all subscribed to, uh, and uh, Freemasonry, in other words. And it, uh, it's really just kind of a serious look at Freemasonry. <laughs> I've seen prices on some of these. These are like uh, on the back cover of every issue of this particular magazine, and they give you prices often like $1,200, $1,500. But I kind of like this, uh, uh, the uh, Saturn like uh, image of the, uh, of the, of the Bieberhut, uh, and, and this is what makes the world go round or something, or at least it le influences the tidal flows of the world. And that really uh, concludes my slideshow. Uh, yes? Did you, did you ever get anything on the Kabbalah and good old Madonna? Yes, but not in this particular set of they, they, They're not interested in Madonna and Burl Park. No, no. Yeah. Are these magazines available to the public in the library? Uh, you, uh, anyone can visit the Stanford Libraries. Uh, we are, uh, at visitors who are not Stanford affiliates are uh, able to come in for seven days a year and register without incurring any charge. So yes, you may come and see these uh, magazines. Where is it? Stanford University, Green Library, Stanford. Uh, yes. So we've had these two views of Yiddish sex and the literature current. So we're going to bring Ken back and we'd like to open up the questions with Ken and Zachary. Do you gentlemen want to come up front? Yeah, I'll just log off and turn Can I take this chair? Sure. And then we can uh, Thank you. talk with both of you. Okay. Can I I'm turning this off, so that's it. Uh, did the, the, the Bubalich of Ukraine, or in Russia, did the Bubalich movement have any influence on, on other Jews in Russia, or were they more in and of to themselves? Or did they actually influence ideologi ideologically other Jewish people around them? Well, uh, this Hasidic sect was engaged in proselytizing, bringing people to, to their fold. So, um, and they mostly were concentrated in, in, in Ukraine and Latvia, in uh, Russian, Russian Poland, and they had their own their own unique traditions, different from other Hasidic sects. The other Hasidic sects were not interested in uh, bringing people back to the righteous path. They were not interested in that. Is there any symbolic relationship between the criddle that you give to the rabbi and the little notes that you put in the Western Same world? thing. Same 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 thing.
Um, so the Lubavitch has embraced technology and the internet. Uh, what about other specific sets? Are they completely divorced from that? They, they do, but they don't flaunt it. And uh, it, 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 it really varies from Hasidic sect to Hasidic sect. In some cases, um, where things have gotten maybe a little bit out of control, where there's lots of um, interaction going on on the net uh, among Hasidim, and, and the word gets out, at that, at that point they start to repress it. Um, there's, of course, always concern about pornography, concern about um, like just general secular knowledge. Uh, so, for that reason, they uh, they eschew using the net, and in some cases, they outright uh, outlaw it. Hasidim are everywhere. Hasidim, I mean, Hasidim. Um, Hasidim and Kathmandu. Yeah, but you, you mean like Hasidic communities. You don't mean just Chabad outreach workers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hasidim did, did go to Argentina. Before the war? Before even, well, for the most part, Hasidim didn't, didn't come to, to the new, to new worlds because the Arabis forbade them from coming. So for the most part, what you have in America are um, Lithuanian Jews, Litvak Jews, Bisnagdim, but the, the children and grandchildren of Bisnagdim who came under the influence of the Enlightenment. And um, Hasidic Rebbe's, as a general rule, did not come to America. If they did come, they took the first boat back to the old country. They sized up the situation, they saw that it was, from their point of view, totally materialistic and corrupt, and uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with America. And uh, but not only Hasidim, but also, um, for example, the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim, who was probably the greatest of the non-Hasidim, the greatest of the Misnagdim in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, wrote a book called Nidche Yisrael, uh, The Faith of Israel. And uh, he uh, pleaded, pleaded with Jews in the old country not to, not to migrate to America. They would lose their, they would lose their soul. But, but they lost anyway, didn't they? Because did they get caught in the Holocaust? Well, most. You could say that, you know, why didn't the Hasidim know that uh, there were um, Oneida communities, uh, Shakers, in the early part of the 19th century, if they, if they, you know, had the foresight, you had some insights into what was going on around the world, you could say, well, like all these other misfitty religious groups in America who didn't, could, you know, couldn't get along with anybody in the old country, uh, who came to places like upstate New York, and they founded uh, the Oneida community, and they founded uh, the, Sh the Shaker, and all those other, you know, I mean, the Hasidim only started to do this in the tail end of the 20th century. If they had the, the you know, if the Rebbe's really had Ruach HaKodesh, they were really endowed with the Holy Spirit, God would have sent down from the, through Elijah the prophet or somebody, I don't know who, uh, that um, the situation in the old country is, um, is, is things are, things are um, going to be a dis potentially, eventually going to be a disaster. Um, but the Rebbe's didn't open secular books, so they were, you know, I'm always pointing out to people that uh, the Ashkenazi Jews, until the middle of the 19th century, uh, the, the Eastern European Jews were utterly incapable of producing a Nobel Prize winner. Because the great majority of Eastern European Jews, up until around 1830, 1840, came under the sway of the Hasidic movement. So even though not everybody was a Hasid, but there were lots of Hasidic fellow travelers, or let's call them Hasidic group, groupies. Um, and uh, so those, the, you know, so until the, the rise of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment came mostly into uh, the Lithuanian part of Eastern Europe, um, Congress Poland uh, was not as um, uh, influenced by it. Uh, those Jews, Jews like, like my parents, uh, and the Jews in Congress Poland and Galicia, the Hasidic, especially the Hasidic Jews, they did not want to come to America. So it was usually the black sheep in the family who came. 
Um, anyway. And there were plenty of those. And there were plenty of those. There were mm -hmm. plenty of those. Yeah. So then, 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 then the Lubavitch, I mean, are these? Well, basically, you see the suckers, at least like the remnants, people who might have come after the war? The great overwhelming majority came after the after war. war. There were very few Rebbe's. Only the Tavustana Rebbe yeah. is one of the few Rebbe's who was okay. here in the early part of the 20th century. And he didn't come from Eastern Europe. He came from, he came from, from Palestine, Palestinian by Eastern Europe. Um, Ken and Zach, I have a question for both of you to answer. Um, what is the percentage of assimilation now with the younger generation? Is it growing or decreasing? And also with this influx of the use of the internet and cell phones, is the use of Yiddish growing because you can have access it to, access it, access to it, or more people just as younger generations are getting older and using more English? Can you comment on, on what's happening? There's a uh, book that just came out last year called Mitzvah Girls. It's uh, by an anthropologist named Ayala Fader, who I believe teaches at Fordham, which is a Jewish Jesuit school in uh, the Bronx. But she spent several years of uh, ethnographic fieldwork in Borough Park studying the uh, religious environment of girls and women. It would have been impossible, really, for her to study the male uh, environment, except in the context of the families that she got to know, the households. And uh, what she, in Borough Park, she was working primarily in these Galician communities, Bobo in particular, uh, as opposed to the Hungarian communities in Williamsburg or the uh, more Litvak ones, uh, uh, Hasidic communities in Crown Heights, or uh, the yeshivish misnagid communities in Lakewood. Now, in the communities that she was studying, many of them are, uh, many of the people in those communities are the people who read the books and magazines that I'm showing you, but by and large, English has a very strong uh, position in these communities, especially among the women. And it is the males uh, through from Cheder uh, to through Yeshiva, who are now sustaining Yiddish, which is uh, turning the language really truly into Tata uh in that particular community. And uh, she explains one of the reasons why English uh, has a not if not a predominant but a strong position among the women is that there was a generation or two after these communities uh, established themselves in the United States when girls' schools, they didn't have their own, let's say, in internal Boba of girls' schools. They went to base Yaakov schools that were uh, already more geared to uh, providing a secular education. And Yiddish as a, an everyday vernacular was, in effect, lost to the girls uh, who were being raised in the 50s and 60s, uh, not, it's not assimilation, but it's, it's, uh, it's just what happened to, uh, to Yiddish. Whereas with the boys, they were going to yeshiva, and, and this probably was your experience, too, that this was uh, whatever else. I don't know, do you have sisters? Uh, no. Cousins? <laughs> yes. The girls, what languages were they speaking? Everybody spoke Yiddish. They spoke Yiddish, okay. Say Chaco schools are modern Orthodox? No. 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 Who wrote that book, Mr. Girls? Her name is Ayala Fader, F A D E R. Uh, but I guess the point I'm making is that, uh, that part of the continuum is a, uh, there is a male female continuum as well. And there are strong attempts that she describes in this book uh, by, in, in the educational systems for the girls to reinforce, the, uh, to reinforce their Yiddish, but even the teachers don't know it na truly natively and deeply or in an educated way. Any other comments on well, the whole, the whole idea of moving out of this, the urban here to the urban enclaves 
into the, the suburbs. The whole, lot, the whole idea of that is that um, whereas, whereas in the old country um, the Jews lived among uh, these babushkas, these uh, Russian, Polish, Ukrainian peasants who were dressed, you know, they were, they were devout, they were pious Christians, and they were, uh, uh, they, they looked very uh, you know, puritanical. Uh, the, 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 today, this is a different world, and the kids are exposed to every, every time they go out into the streets, they, they, they see girls in miniskirts, they see, um, you know, they, they, uh, they, they're exposed to all kinds of things that didn't exist. Even, even the days when I was growing up. Elvis Presley started it. He had tight pants. <laughs> so, um, so that's that's a serious problem. Uh, this, your second, the second half of your question is uh, is whether uh, Yiddish is having a revival. Well, yes, because they're, they're having a population. There's a there's a population explosion going on among the Hasidim. So, uh, but the question is, are they passing down the Yiddish traditions? Uh, in some sects, yes, and in other sects, no. Uh, the Hasidic sect that I came from, the Gera Hasidim, in Israel, they are the most uh, non-anti-Zionist of anti-Zionist Hasidim. Yeah. So uh, they're, uh, you know, they they have the MPs in the, in the uh, uh, parliament, and they uh, they founded the Gera Hasidim were the ones who founded the Agudat Yisrael party. So they were not as violently opposed to the concept of the state of Israel as, for example, the, the Hungarian Hasidim, the Satma, the Munkacha, the Puppa, the Tsailama. Uh, these are, um, and, and, and the interesting thing is that you know, the more vehemently opposed they are to the state of Israel, the, the more ultra-Orthodox they tend to be, and the more they are intent on passing down Yiddish. So, uh, so that's one, that's, so among certain Hasidic groups, uh, and particularly the, the Lubavitcher, Chabad, um, most kids uh, in their twenties and you know, uh, in their teens and twenties are no longer speaking Yiddish, and uh, probably can't carry on a conversation in Yiddish. Yeah. I think there is a revival of Yiddish outside of the Hasidic movement. Where? In Israel. You know, it used to be a time in the forties and fifties when you couldn't have a Yiddish play. Yeah. And today you have Yiddish plays. Yeah. You have that teaching Yiddish in the Hebrew University, that teaching Yiddish at Stanford. So I think there is a revival of Yiddish. Yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> How can you have a revival of Yiddish if you don't have uh, the environment that perpetuates that, that culture? So you, go, you, go, you, you learn Yiddish at Stanford University, and what do you, what do, you do with it? You, who do you talk to? Who do you get to talk to? You can read Shalom Aleichem. You get to read Shalom Aleichem? Uh, maybe, yeah. So, uh, you can you set up a Facebook page. Right, yeah. <laughs> and could you address the, uh, the Yiddish publication in newspapers uh, in, uh, out of Brooklyn? Well, I know, uh, you know, I read uh, two of them because I don't know what the enemy is, you know, <laughs> up to. Uh, I read uh, the Yiddish Vot, which is. Um, a publication put out by the Aguda Yisrael. And it's mostly, uh, uh, as Zachary pointed out, it's haggy, lots of hagiographic stuff. It, it's mostly uh, glorifying the Rebbe's. And, but they also, they, uh, they also, they plagiarize a lot of uh, historical material as well. They, they take out a straight uh, his, history books. And so uh, sometimes it's it's worthwhile reading because you get kind of a synopsis. You don't have to read the whole history book yet. So, you know. uh, but um, uh, and also the Deit, uh, which is a Satmar Satma publication. And the interesting thing about the Satmar publication is that um, there are no no pictures, no pictures either of not, not not only not women but also not men. Uh, very strict about this whole concept of uh, thou shalt not uh, make a graven image. You see, the interesting thing is that the only Yiddish newspaper in the Forbes, the publications of the Algonian Journal is four times that of the Forbes alone, that will own the other three yeah, Pacific papers. So uh, there's a lot more going on there than there is in the secular world. But even in the heyday of the Forbes, a uh, so called uh, Balbatisha Hasidisha Yid, uh, a Hasidisha Jew with 
Hasidic dignity would not swoop down to the level of reading the Pharaohs, which was for the, the, the Habachinikis, which were the Jewish peasants. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, you refer to these enclaves in various towns. How, how is it possible to maintain that sort of segregation? Would, there, would you run into fair housing laws, or how would it work? Well, the last, yeah, the last time I went to a square town, uh, not only are you dealing with, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, isolation and segregation, uh, there are signs in Yiddish that say that um, men can only walk on one side of the street and women can only walk on one side of the street. So it's extremely um, regulated and segregated, um, and it, it seems to work for them. And they're also masters of the political process in terms of local politics. Because they vote and block. The Rebbe puts out the word, and nobody's going to go against the Rebbe. So it's the most uh, heinous thing that somebody could do. So, <clears throat> and that's why politicians like to they like to deal with the Rebbe's. The Rebbe yeah. is guaranteed yeah. to. Uh, it's just it's like, sort of like a war dealer on the west side yeah. of Chicago. No, it's parallel. To, it's parallel to the CEOs of our companies here, where they double check each other, and it doesn't go down with the other people. No, you have another question? I was just saying, communities to respond to people who are attracted to that way of life that did not grow up that way, either either by marriage or just they want to find themselves and they try to join it. And to come to, to enter that community. Yeah. Well, I wish you had seen this this film. This film in its entirety. Um, so you have a segment there where, where um, some very secular kid. Um, I guess uh, he was told uh, by some friends to check out this particular Rebbe. He checks out this square Rebbe and he was smitten by the Rebbe. And, uh, but at the same time, and this is guy is a, a basketball coach wearing a Biba hit, a kapata, and he, he, he works in a Yeshiva University type of environment uh, where he talks about how these uh, kids with the knitted yarmulkes are much more interested in basketball than they are in Jewish history and Jewish culture. Uh, but um, uh, what happens there is that uh, they also interview this guy's mother. And he, uh, it turns out that the mother instructed the son that um, he better not try to convince his younger brother to go visit that Rebbe. Oh. In other words, um, I've already lost one son, and I don't want to lose any more. I was going to comment that in Mitzvah Girls, the uh, author, who is a secular American-born anthropologist, but who has chosen this as her field of study, and if you're doing ethnography, it's not something you just visit one day a week. You become, you have to become part of the community you're observing. And uh, these were, this was done in an, her work, her field work was done in an urban community in, in Brooklyn. And uh, and the people she was working with grasped what she was up to, but uh, did not discourage her from uh, engaging in her research because they felt that just the very act of uh, doing this research, given her sincerity and whatever other attributes she brought with her, meant that she was uh, might be nevertheless reclaimed for uh, for. Uh, for eternity, and in fact, uh, she wasn't. Uh, she went back, she finished her research, she uh, went back to the Reformed Jewish community, that wherever it was uh, that she belonged to, and, and that was that. But they uh, felt that as, this was not a group like Lubavitch that reached out, but rather, if you came to them and you s appeared to be sincere, as I think you were uh, indicating in your talk, Ken, they would. Uh, but you have to be pretty, you have to demonstrate that she didn't flaunt anything like short sleeves or, or a, a skirt, you know, above the knee. Well, different, yeah, again, different Hasidic sects. I mean, some sects, uh, I would rather go to a uh, Sikh temple or, uh, <laughs> a, you know, be among Buddhists than show up the way, uh, the way I look. Uh, to the Hasidic, uh, Hasidic synagogue, uh, certain Hasidic synagogues, certainly Sapra and Skver, I would, I would never want to show up. I mean, I would have to really 
transmogrify into a chassid again, once again, to feel comfortable there. And they, they will really make you feel un uncomfortable. Uh, on the other hand, there are also like sects other than the Chabad. There's, for example, the Breslev. And the joke among, in my family, among my brothers, is that the rejects from Hare Krishna end up, end up, in, end up in Breslev. And, um, uh, and so the Breslever are like the you know guys with you know a thousand acid pits and uh, you know uh, the burnout a lot of burnouts a lot of uh, you know escapees from psychiatric wards. Uh, I, I'm not kidding around. I'm not kidding around. Lots of very lots of borderline people. Well, um, lots of borderline you know, people. Well, on that thought, we're going to wrap. Up. <laughs> Think on that note. Um, I have a I'm, message. Wash your hands. Oh. <laughs> But I'd like to thank Ken Blady and Zachary Baker for your presentation. Uh, we're here if you want to ask a few more questions, but we're on a break, and the next programs begin in about 15 minutes. So carry on and enjoy.